If you would kindly explain more experiences with your teachers, your serpent-like teachers from a distant galaxy. Are you the only person to have such experiences that you know of? There must be many more people. You're not aware of anybody? I'm not. Uh, I've never heard of anybody else having these. Maybe they're not talking about it. <laughs> but Sri M is talking about it, though only rarely. In his autobiography in 2010, Sri M informed the world about his multiple encounters with spiritually advanced serpents, which he has encountered in the Himalayas, and astonishingly on two separate occasions in another planet called Sarpaloka, in another solar system. I've seen some people who have extraordinarily advanced and seen things which we cannot even imagine, even I cannot imagine. Even though he's described these serpent beings in his first book, Sri M is willing but reluctant to talk about it now. He knows he opens himself to ridicule. When you talk about such things, usually you need to be very careful. Oh, yeah. People might think either this guy is just bluffing or he's out of his mind. There are significant spiritual experiences and lessons in this interview from a number of teachers. However, followers of Sri M often seek greater clarification about his visits to that unknown world called Sarpa Loka, which caused him fear. Well, I was scared. <laughs> when the first time I had an encounter, I was really, really scared. Sure. And I can't deny that because can you imagine a snake talking to you? And can you imagine Sri M talking to spiritual pillars of the East, Mahavatar Sri Guru Babaji, Shirdi Sai Baba, and Maheshwarnath Babaji? all having a hand in Sri M's self-realization. If you are part of the awakening or self-realized status that is our, is our birthright, yeah. to whom would you pray? I don't you? pray. Welcome to Soul Journeys. Sri M is said to be a living yogi, although he shuns titles of all kinds. Sri M has rocketed to global prominence after he began talking about Ancient Teachers and Extraterrestrial Experiences. Learn more about this in Soldier's two earlier interviews with Sri M in his home in Madhnapali, India in 2012. He describes to me this explosion of interest in his experiences as a circus, but of the spiritual lessons taken from his experiences, Sri M is dead serious. This interview, part one, was recorded during his speaking tour to Burbank, California, on August 15th, 2018. Welcome back to Soul Journeys. Thank you. I want to talk about many things, but you reminded me of a question that came to my mind. Listening to you speak to an audience in Burbank last night, you talked about the truth of who we are, Satchitananda, being awareness bliss. They're all equal, being awareness and bliss. But in my heart, I think of awareness being more equal. Is it? Yeah, I think so, because um, without basic awareness, you know, just not being aware of something, then there's no point in anything else. The most important thing is to be aware. Aware not only about ourselves when we close our eyes and look at ourselves in our mind, but also awareness of the outside world and how we interact with the outside. This is also very important. And you're convinced you are positive awareness is eternal. I am convinced that awareness is not a, a product of the brain. Let's put it this way. Is the brain's temporal? Yeah. It's, it's, it's that which uh, understands everything that the brain conceives of, processes and thinks about. This I am convinced. I can't give you a, a scientific proof in a test tube, but... Uh, and uh, are you equally convinced that that brain you just referred to yes. is for all intents and purposes the only br the only thought, the only mind? Yes. And you are part of it? Absolutely. See, we normally we talk about the mind the mind has not been located anywhere in the body except in the brain. Now, so this is the brain, the mind we are talking about normally. We are saying that apart from that, 
there is an awareness and consciousness which is separate from it, but it uses the brain like a supercomputer and operates. Okay. So, let me come to another question. Suppose, um, have we ever thought about this? Can we think without a language? No. Do infants think without a language? We don't know. But we, as grown-ups, we cannot think without a language. We can, uh, the feelings are there, of course, but the moment the feelings come, they're translated into words. And if you have to think, you might be thinking in German, English, Hindi, uh, whichever language you're familiar with, you need language. So we are asking this question, is it possible to have thought, or I would say awareness, without a language? And the nearest thing I can think of in this world is music. Mm. I'm not talking about uh, uh, vocal music, I'm talking about instrumental music, like a symphony or something like that. You don't need a language to enjoy it, right? You don't have to interpret it, you just enjoy it. You may be from here, from India, from anywhere, but you enjoy it. But in a way, it is its own language. Uh, ma to compose music, you require your own language. But once music is on, then it's transcends language. What I'm trying to say is one step better than language, trying to convey this. Which is why in the ancient times, the rishis who looked into this, who experienced this said, yad vajana bhutitam, that which words cannot explain. But then we are stuck because without words we can't convey anything. Interesting you should say that. Later on I'm going to ask you about that very concept. Mm -hmm about words that cannot be used to explain the concept of self-realization later on. Because we have nothing else with us to explain. Yeah, we'll come to that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I should officially <laughs> welcome you again. It's been six years, for those who don't know, since I made the 11-hour trip from Puttaparthi, India to Madhnapali, India. It was not an easy trip. <laughs> the driver was lost, but we got there. <laughs> we got there to interview you at your beautiful yeah. ashram. Um, what is the most important thing that has happened to you since the coming out of your autobiography, which really laid it all on the line, apprenticed to a Himalayan master, a yogi's autobiography? Did you meet me last time before the autobiography was out? Or? Right after. I, I think to put in a few words, what happened is I was living in Madhnapalli quietly doing my things. A few people used to come and sit with me. There was no paraphernalia. You know what I mean? Sure. And then came the autobiography. Now, I couldn't stop writing the autobiography because my master, Babaji, had told me that I need, should do it at some point. So I did it. Now, with the coming of the autobiography, word spread that there's somebody sitting here who, who has gone through all this. So people started gathering. There were newspaper interviews. I would put it in uh, the words of a friend of mine who said, so the circus started. <laughs> Good word. <laughs> now the circus is on and sometimes I despair and think I should get out. But then I look at the faces of people who are around me and say, what will happen if I get out? The whole thing will be a mess. Mm -hmm. Each person will define me in its own, you know, my different ways. and. What I try to convey would be lost in this whole thing. So, to put in a few words, I think that it became, uh, it grew into a, uh, an organization precisely. Mm -hmm. And organizations have their own problems. Mm -hmm. They can detract from the truth. Individuals have their own problems. Organizations have more problems. No. Individuals have problems which are a different kind. Mm -hmm. But the organizational problems is, that even what you said and what you did can be, for the purpose of organization, misinterpreted. Mm -hmm. I have to be very careful. That's one thing which I have to watch out in this, since it has grown and become bigger and we have schools and various things are happening. I have to stay sane in the midst of all this. Staying sane is important in a world where you will be misunderstood. Absolutely. We have to There's be There's no very question careful. about that. We have to be very careful. People will disbelieve you. People will not hold you kindly in other thoughts. So we have to look at So you're in the circus right now. You're in the public world. Yeah, I don't know whether I'm managing the circus or I'm the clown in it, but I'm there. Does, you, does your wife like the circus? <laughs> this is a personal question. <laughs> to be honest, she doesn't. 
<laughs> I said that because I knew the answer. I hope you're patient with me. I'm aware of my time. I'm editing questions as I go along. I'm throwing out good questions to get to this, and then we'll get back to regular questions. I'm very comfortable with you. So far. <laughs> a, a quarter of a million people, I'm very happy to say, it makes me feel like your message is reaching people uh, way beyond what I ever expected. They've seen our interview from six years ago on Soul Journeys from 2012. Many of those people write me, and they still have the same question. They want more details about a topic we talked about. I would be remiss if I didn't follow up with your previous interview, if you would kindly explain more experiences with your teachers, Maheshwarnath Babaji, Mahavatar Babaji, I don't think you would use that name to call him that, Shirdi Sai Baba, and your serpent-like teachers from a distant galaxy, Sarpaloka, Nagaloka, Nagarashi, if I'm saying any of those correctly. Are you the only person to have such experiences that you know of? There must be many more people. You're not aware of anybody? I'm not. Uh, I've never heard of anybody else having these. Maybe they're not talking about it. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that I can't be an exception. It's not possible. So you think there are others? Huh? You think there are others? I am sure there are others. Uh, there may be unknown. I have a job, so I'm doing it. So I'm known. It's Babaji's problem. But um, I think there are many unknown. You know what? I have seen people who are not known anywhere in the outside world, who have no internet, who have nothing, who live quietly. Uh, in a small remote village somewhere in the mountains. It need not necessarily be the Himalayas. Mm -hmm. They have a cow, they sell milk, they drink milk, they have a small plot of land, they eat the food. I've seen some people who have extraordinarily advanced and seen things which we cannot even imagine, even I cannot imagine. So I'm not a great person. <laughs> they're greater than me. But they're not known. Well, you're now known. Now you know, I'm known. Yeah. <laughs> uh, let's begin with uh, Maheshwarnath Babaji left his body many years ago. But I assume you still hear from him. In fact, I'm sure you do. He, he advises you and he commands you. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, but it's not so. Um, in fact, I don't need to because just before he left his physical body, now this is a strange thing. He he said he was going to give fifty percent of what was in him into me. Mm. Not a possession, mm -hmm. more like an energy. So with that inside, with that uh, now flowing through my system, I don't need to ask him what do things. I'm on my own. Uh, so I don't keep in touch with him. Oh, well, because of my love and affection, I very often think of him. Yes. Uh, sometimes, rarely, I dream of him. But I don't see him in visions or anything of that kind because it's not required. You see, normally we see somebody when we want to discuss some matters or try to ask questions. and It always comes to me now, so I don't need to ask him. There's another concept too. I mean, I, you don't seem to talk much about uh, Vedanta, Advaita, the oneness, non-duality, but you talk about it in other terminology yeah. all the time. So if you are part of the awakening or self-realized status that <clears throat> is, our, is our birthright, <laughs> yeah. to whom would you pray? So why would I don't you, pray. I was going to say, why would you pray to your teacher? I don't pray. I might pray to myself. <laughs> Well, that makes sense. <laughs> no, not as a human being, as right. a human, but yourself as the one, as the, the inner as self, the inner self. I want to make sure people understand. What the the inner self is not Mahishwarnath Babaji. Mahishwarnath Babaji's inner self and my inner self are the same. and your inner self are the same. Mm -hmm. So I turn in and pray, and I, I don't want, I don't have to say, oh, I lack this, give me that, because if the inner self knows before I say. Don't you think this is a very important lesson for others to hear over and over again about yeah. the non-duality, the existence? People pray saying, I want this. I want. Who are you praying to? The one who you're praying to, suppose he's your antaryami, one who sits inside your heart. He knows everything that you need. Why are you asking him? Better put me more in touch with you would be a better prayer. So, Mahavatar 
Babaji, my word. That's no, that's I'm that's I'm also. Mean, you don't pray. I mean, you, do you, does he <laughs> communicate to you still this five hundred year old mythical person who you know it's is not a mythical person who you know is not <laughs> mythical? Well, it's not a, he's not a mythical, he or he, whatever it is, is not a mythical person. And I can't say anything about this because it's, I consider it sacred boundaries which I cannot cross. I don't want to say anything about this. Yeah, sometimes it's not prayer, but one likes to adore such beings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And touch their feet once in a while. Because it's, I have also in my past, if you believe in past lives, in my past, been with Sri Guru, we call him Sri Guru Babaji. I've been with Sri Guru Babaji as his disciple. So for me, there is a very intimate relationship. And unlike Mahesh or Nath Babaji, he will not leave and go away. He's not going to die to attain Samadhi and leave his body. It's not going to happen. If he has to go, he'll fade away, but still there. Is Sri Guru Babaji still on this plane? Yeah. For people, yes. you come across people who yes. encounter him. Still, today? well, if I don't know, if, uh, I can't be sure because because there's so much Babaji in the internet now mm -hmm. yeah. that many people might imagine they saw Babaji. Yeah. So I can't comment on that. Yeah. But that such a being exists and very much active even now, I have no doubt about this. Your book speaks about this in vivid detail, and I'm going to make a guess that most people believe every word of what you've spoken. I'm not so sure. Well, I, I don't I know either, but if they get from page one to the last page, I might guess that by that time they might become aware that this man believes what he's saying to be true. Of course. That, yes. Whether it's right or wrong, it's up to them. Mm -hmm. But I believe what I've said. So I understand why you're reluctant to reveal some of the innermost intimate exchanges. So let's go to another teacher. Shirdi Sai Baba. He died. His physical form died in 1918. You met him in the flesh. While telling me about your encounter with Shirdi Sai Baba, you told me that he had much to say about him, but that this is that six years ago was not the time to say it. When, if not now, to say it, you're going to be 70 years old. You're an <laughs> old man. I can say that because I'm a couple of years older than you okay. are. If when, if not now, to share these insights, we still time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I am not trying to escape from this, but uh, I know I told you that six years ago, and I still need to say that this time for this, we can't say everything that happened. Can you categorize? Give us a little insight as to what we can expect when you do choose to share this. Mm. It's. It was mostly a kind of breaking down of uh, many images and uh, many convictions which I falsely had about spiritual matters. Mm. He was setting the record. And Maheshwarnath Babaji was with me at the time. Yes. So. Without him, I couldn't have gone in and seen him. So you met Shirdi Sai Baba in the flesh, in the physical form, well after he died. You weren't born in 1918. No, no. You weren't alive. With your teacher. Yeah. And did your, was your teacher surprised? Was your teacher no. impressed with the no, lessons? No, I think he knew what was going to happen. Uh -huh. He took me in and he was very much there. In fact, when he, when I, when I saw him or I thought I saw him, whatever, he said to do pranams to mm -hmm. me, which I did. And the, the, the legs were as solid as Maheshwarnath Babaji's legs. There was no different. The feet, I'm sorry, not the legs. Yeah. So, did he look the same as the images that we have recorded on photographs of him? Yes, yes, absolutely. Did he talk with a voice that you would hear yes, physically? Yes, yes. Did you spend a lot of time with him? 10 minutes at the most, which is a big time. What was his message to the outside world that supersedes what we know? He didn't say anything to me about that message. He didn't give any message for the outside. You know what he told me? He gave me a list of places to go on pilgrimage. 
He came back to give you a list? Yeah, and uh, most of the, th no, he said something which I don't want to say okay. now, that's a yes, different yes, matter. Yes. But apart from that, he said, to go to these places, and not only that, he put his hands into his pocket and gave me a bunch of currency notes. Now, the, you know, the, it's you mentioned that earlier. Yeah, Speak it's more all the it's more serious because uh, it's, uh, uh, a phantom, uh, which is just an image, cannot give you money, which is solid. Which, in fact, I had some one coin with me for a long time, and I was wondering what to do with it. Till one day, I couldn't find it. So none of the money he gave you, you have. You either spent it or you lost it. No, he told me to spend it. He didn't ask me to keep it. <laughs> but souvenir. accidentally, there was some mm -hmm. something left, which after a while, I don't know where it went, but I misplaced it or it's gone. Somebody would say it might have disappeared. I don't know. But uh, so I took it and went to all the places which he asked me to go. <laughs> well, we're waiting. We hope there's nothing terrible in your future for a while so that you'll have time <laughs> to record or share maybe with us in writing in your next book. But maybe when you come next we can to Madhnapali? It might be time to discuss. <laughs> to Madhnapali you're welcome. That's a this time when you come to Madhnapali, stay for a couple of days. Now we have a guest house. It's nice. Yeah. Yeah, it's quite nice. I've been there. It is nice. It's very, very yeah. nice. I'm sure it's crowded with people now. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> not crowded. Because when I'm there, there's a big crowd. Mm -hmm. When I'm not, there's hardly Nobody anybody. Yeah. So I ask people, go when I'm not there. It's beautiful, <laughs> quiet, calm. <laughs> These were the easy questions. Ah. <laughs> In the remaining time, you told me earlier, and I've never forgotten it, that you've had two visits to a planet in a far-off galaxy where there are Naga beings, Sarpa serpents, who can easily become humans. You say it is arrogant for anybody to think such places do not exist in the vastness of the universe. Many here who are your followers certainly believe you, but know little of your encounters because you don't talk much about them. Could you say more? Yes, I, I there are realms which are not known to normal human beings to mankind and where astronomers telescopes still cannot reach because they may be light years away. However, the mind, uh, the, the subtle uh, part of our being which uh, has nothing to do with time and space can go there. I don't think anybody is going to reach there at some point in a rocket because it's so many, uh, uh, what do you call that? Uh, time years away or whatever. Light years away. Light years. Yeah. So, but it's a fact that such universes exist because it is my experience uh, and I've been there and I've seen beings there uh, who uh, are Nagas. In fact, I have elaborately mentioned this in my autobiography. You did? Yeah. But there's many details you left out, I'm sure. And I'm no. going to ask you about some of them. Okay. Okay, so let's just... Cr um, you told me, for example, that you visited there in your subtle body. I was under the mm -hmm. incorrect impression that you visited there in your physical body. No. But you said it was very similar, but more glorified than your physical body. No dream, no hallucination. Can you say more about the subtle body so many, so few of us are aware of? I believe, uh, not believe, when you believe then you don't know. Yeah. Well, then every human being has a subtle body. Every human. Now this is not so important uh, from the point of view of the spiritual search. But since you asked the question, I don't talk much about it because I think it takes people off on a tangent mm -hmm. instead of going to the core. So uh, anyway, since... Of, of softening your heart, which is your main... <laughs> yes, I understand. Since you're asking me, yes, every human being has a subtle body and it's not such a big deal. And, uh, to say that, oh, if there's a subtle body, why am I not moving out of the physical body? Every night we move out. You talked about that as the clairvoyance. Actually, you see light, small light uh, threads emit from their yeah, houses yeah. to the ears. If you're clairvoyant, yeah. every night everybody leaves, goes, travels, and comes back. It's not as if, uh, but the brain doesn't remember the experiences. Uh, when the mind becomes pure and clearer, then the first step that happens is that you remember things that happen before you can consciously do it, if you want to. 
It's not that to progress spiritually you have to do it. There's nothing like that. Okay. But when the mind, when the when the awareness of our self becomes loose from this physical attachments and cravings, then it becomes light enough to even involuntarily come out, even when you don't want to, mm -hmm. and move around. So let me explain this a little more. Since you say detail, yes, physically. This is possible to do this only in this physical world, generally. It will take some time before you can accustom yourself to go far out of the galaxy. Mm. It's not easy to do that. Into the farther reaches of the yeah, universe. It requires training. And usually, even if it happens for the first time or even for a month, you come out and then there is this gripping fear, what if I can't go back? Mm. You're back. You're back. Half a second. Did that happen to you? Is that what happened when you visited? Of course it happened to me earlier. Is there earlier. a name to the planet you visited? Well, we call it the Nagaloka. Nagaloka, the place of the I don't the think serpents. it has any equivalent in uh, yeah. modern astronomical terms. But there are serpents here. There are serpents here, but these serpents are different <laughs> from that. <laughs> uh, is there no the more? Here serpents are subsidiary to human beings. They're, they are the major. And there are no human beings. It, it, except it, occasional visitors like us. <laughs> And I think, if I remember correctly, the serpents who transform themselves into the yeah. human appearance. But that's only when they want to present themselves before human beings. So you don't scare you to death? Well, I was scared. <laughs> <laughs> when the first time I had an encounter, I was really, really scared. Sure. And I can't deny that because can you imagine a snake talking to you? No. It would be terrible. It's like you see it only in fiction movies. <laughs> Well, not only talking to you, you yourself said that your teacher, yeah, Maheshwana was Babaji, talking to him, hissed to the snakes, yes. and they hissed back in uh, a way that communicated. Not snakes, one only. One. <laughs> but so that was their means of communication. Of communication. That is to... <laughs> <laughs> you, you used to worry about being ridiculed for some of the utterances <laughs> that come out of your mouth. I suspect you're over that <laughs> fear. <of laughs> yeah. I'm still not completely over that fear, but when you talk about such things, usually you need to be very careful oh because yeah. people might think either this guy is just bluffing or he's out of his mind. No, you talk about it with conviction in such a way that it makes me wonder if this is a place of love, peace and joy only, the way you describe these You mean I'm talking about yes, Nagaloka? Nagalo Nagalok. um, is there no conflict there? No, no war? there is. There is. Could so these are the higher beings. Different level, yeah. Right. Different, different level. types of. In fact, uh, Maheshwaranath Babaji told me that this man, or not this man, this being has come to resolve a conflict. He wanted some advice from. Me. So. He came to yeah. this world yeah. to learn about yes. how to resolve a conflict yes. in his own world. He said, this "I need some advice," which means yogis who are still there in the physical body here mm -hmm. sometimes may be much more advanced than any. In Intra-terrestrial beings. This is what I mean. The details have so much information <laughs> that you haven't shared with us in your book. The I deputy chief. I'm now as much as I can. You, you mentioned the deputy chief whom you've met. Now, the deputy chief comes to ask a human being, I mean a yeah. person in a human body. Human and being he comes as? We don't know. In a human body. Yeah. And he wants to resolve a conflict there and seeks his advice. I mean, this is... Serious stuff. Serious stuff. And if you want to go back uh, several years ago, when Shirdi Sai Baba left his body for three days mm -hmm. and came back, and when they asked him, where were you, what were you doing, he said in an interplanet, some other planet, there was some crisis and I just went to sort it out. Well, might this have been Nagaloka? Could be. He didn't say Nagaloka. What does it look like there? Are there, are there? Is there terrain? Are there buildings? Are there homes? They don't need trains. They don't know. They have the places to live, which are like, I mean, I won't go more to more detail. Did you find yourself <laughs> becoming at ease with them, even though you were in your light body? For the first time, subtle body. For the first time, I was not at ease, mm. and then I learned to come to terms. Did they tell you what they knew about your home planet, about the Earth? And now we are going into territory which I <laughs> wouldn't want to Okay, we'll wait right for the book to come out. Okay. <laughs> no, I might talk to you, <laughs> but don't know. <laughs> um, 
do they walk among us today on this earth? Do what? Do they walk among us today in human form on this earth? Now I'm a little careful about saying this because okay. nowadays in the YouTube and internet there's a lot of stuff which is like nonsense, you know. Uh, so I'm a little reluctant because they're, oh, what is it called? Walk-ins. Walk-ins walk like and so on, you know. So I don't want You're in the epicenter of walk-ins, Hollywood. I know. <laughs> <laughs> so I have to be a little careful with what I'm saying. Somebody might say, the other day somebody asked me if I was a walk-in. I said, no, I'm fully in control of myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> have you found any scientists on this planet who understand where you're coming from? Where I'm coming from? Yeah, it was something that they can that you cannot verify, and and uh, they might ordinarily be skeptical of, but they listening to you and they come over. There and are a couple of uh, people I know. One of them, of course, is a very uh, important neurosurgeon who lives in Bangalore. Mm -hmm. I think he understands in some way that uh, what I'm up to, yeah. and that there are possibilities of looking into this. In fact, this is something I wanted to tell you. With sorry, with his help, um, I will, I'm trying to work on a book, which I would like to title as uh, the neurological basis of spiritual experience. Mm. Which means, when spiritual it's becoming a popular topic, I'm working yeah. on it every I minute. Mean, I have so many things to do that uh, I don't get enough time. But I've done about four chapters or so, and it's kind of in the... And I'm sorry I interrupted you. When you come to a neurological understanding of spiritual, uh, that seems yeah, to be yeah. what you were what saying. I, what I was trying to say is that when you have a spiritual experience, there are many things happening in your brain, in the neurological system, in your central nervous system, in your sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, and in the brain. There are many things happening. So I'm trying to figure out if it's possible to distinguish a man who's just faking and saying that I'm having experience, and a genuine man through understanding the reactions that take place in the mm -hmm. brain. Mm -hmm. You know, this is probably what and I'm And of course, you would be one of their test subjects right away. If they yeah, yeah. So up. they can. I'm free yeah. to be tested. How about theologians or mystics or religious intellectuals who have read your book, who have heard your story? How do, how do they react to it? Uh, this reaction from people, intellectuals, politicians, scientists, uh, you know, there's a wide spectrum out here. Mm -hmm. There are some who believe everything that I say. And there are some who don't believe everything, but believe some parts. There are some who feel that they should explore and probably they'll find out about it. And there are some who are skeptics, but who are very friendly with me because they can't understand because they have known me for many years and I don't usually tell lies. So, you so have if this guy is saying them. this, either he is mentally gone completely or it can't be, it may be. So even there are, I know I have good friends among the Marxists. You know that I was born and brought up in Kerala. Sure. As, only as a Muslim. Hmm, as a Muslim. And that's the only state in India which still has a Marxist government, even today. They would not have guessed that. Yeah. And even they have some understanding with me. They feel that this guy, there's some substance to what he's saying. Marxism is atheism too, isn't it? Yeah. So I have no conflict. You resonate with them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not, I'm not in conflict with their ideology. <laughs> I'm more about the human being whether they can improve or can you bring about a revolution by killing thousands of people. This is what I disagree with. The beliefs, they can keep to themselves. I believe that God exists, somebody else believes God doesn't exist. It's your belief against his. Mm -hmm. A reality, unless you find out, you don't know. <laughs> we live on a planet that has arguably seven to eight billion inhabitants. Are there more inhabitants? Serpent inhabitants on Sarpaloka and Nagaloka? Um, I can't say. I've not thought about it. Were this. they all uniformly polite to you? No. What, what were the ones who were not polite to you say? Oh, they were wondering what is this puny human being doing here? 
<laughs> when they're coming to this world to ask for advice on some questions. Yeah, from great people, not from yeah, ordinary okay. human beings. <laughs> so, so, which, I, I don't want to get off this subject, but I do want to ask, what help is there for Sarpaloka or for planet Earth after, the, since the re beginning of historical utterances and recordings, we are still not at peace, love, and no. joy. Is there hope? I think there is hope. All the work that we do, including my work and with several others, there is still hope. If there was no hope, we would have just shut up and gone, do nothing. But there is great hope. This is the end of part one of Souljourn's 2018 two-part interview series with Sri M. Part two includes more about Sri M's spiritual mission and lessons learned. If you're new to Sri M, be sure to take a look at Souljourn's first two-part series about him, recorded in 2012, and view more of our 400-plus interviews at souljourns.net.